Our study tonight, I love these next three chapters, four, five, and six. I wish I had the time to do them all at one setting. I don't in, in obviously, one evening. But tonight we're going to do Ezra 4 and 5. Pray for me. There's a lot of reading, and as you know, I can't see. So uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful, God. We're grateful to be here. We're grateful to sing that we worship you. Grateful to come before your throne tonight and hear what you have for each and every one of us. I pray that by the power of your spirit, Laura, that I will make this a Bible study that is so relevant, so practical for us, that we can see just how faithful you are to work behind the scenes, working all things together for the good of those who love you and who are called according to your purpose. We're in the Old Testament, Lord, but but these are examples of that very famous New Testament verse in action. So give us ears to hear and hearts to respond. I pray, Father, although it's an Old Testament midweek Bible study, I pray that if there's even one person who's come in here who isn't born again, that this would be the night when they would look to you and say, what am I doing? Why am I resisting you knocking on the door of my heart? And Maybe this is the night that he or she or even they will surrender their hearts and become born-again Christians. And just maybe, Lord, just maybe they could be the last ones and we can all rejoice together. And as wonderful as our worship was tonight with Amy and Caleb, I'm sure the worship in heaven will be even better. We love you, God. We're grateful for all that you've done. Bless this time tonight for your glory. Amen. This Bible study and next week's come at a really good time uh, for me personally um, because we're approaching our 28th birthday as a church. Three weeks from tonight uh, is our 28th birthday as a church, May 31st, 1995, was when we began. And um, thinking about God working behind the scenes, I think on that night, Paul and I are both going to share, um, just share examples of how God worked behind the scenes. How did we get here 28 years later? And all the things that we've seen God do, the, the, the way we've watched him work on our behalf, um, certainly we're not going to be able to get them all in, but um, I just think it's a good time to remember the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And this Bible study is an example of it. You know, when we got here, it was in our first full year here. I remember one day getting a phone call uh, from somebody in a radio station. And uh, he wanted to, to meet. And, and I said, well, sure, we can meet. But you have an idea what somebody says? Well, I'd like to do an interview with you on the radio. Just five, ten minutes, we have a, a Sunday morning radio show that plays. And, and uh, you know, I'd just like to introduce you to San Antonio and hear what the Lord's put in your heart. So I said, okay. Now, when something happens like that, you're brand new and you're struggling. And at that point, Paul and I weren't even eating. I mean, that's how difficult things were. And I remember looking at Paul and saying, Paula, guy just called out of the blue wants to interview me on the radio. God is really moving. And here's what I thought. I thought there's going to be one bazillionaire <laughs> who's listening to that radio program and God's going to put on his heart, give a bazillion dollars to Calvary Chapel of San Antonio. And I thought that's going to be the way everything kicks off. It wasn't like that at all. Turns out the guy had an interview with another pastor who canceled on him and he was in this area And he wanted to interview somebody close. That's why I got the phone call. Well, in the interview, the very first thing that he asked me was, so, Pastor Ron, how do you start a church from scratch? And my response to him was, I have no idea. (laughs) Call me in five years, ask me the same question, and I'll tell you if, in fact, we're still here. I'll tell you how to start a church from scratch. But... Right now, I don't have any idea at all. Well, tonight, how do you rebuild a temple? 
Zerubbabel, Joshua, they would say, I don't know. And here's how you do it. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That gives me a chance to plug our next study after Ezra. We're going to go into the prophecy of Haggai. And he figures prominently when we get to chapter 5 in our study tonight. Ezra chapter 4, opposition arises. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard, now you remember the, the loud noise. The foundation was laid and everybody was was going crazy, some happy, some sad, but there was a loud noise and all of the people, remember, there's no walls, there's no anything to drown out the noise, people heard. So when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that loud noise, that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build. I'm going to put a little bit of drama in this. Let us help you build because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Eshardadan, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Your God, our God, same person. And we want to sacrifice to him. And so we see what you're doing. It's some great work and we want to be a part of it. Now, the enemies of God here would be the early Samaritans. Those are the ones that occupied the land while Judah was in captivity in Babylon. We remember that Nebuchadnezzar left behind the old and the poor. And for those years, the 70 years, they lived off the land. Now, the Samaritans, of course, who had been living off this land as well, well, they weren't pleased that the remnant had returned to upset their humble way of life. Now, I want you to think about something we remember from our study last time, that the very first order of business was to rebuild the altar. I told you last week, you can have a a temple, but not without an altar. You can have an altar without a temple. And the altar is always the place to start. It's sort of the foundation. And, And we need all of us to go back to that altar. For us, it's The cross of Christ, Jesus said, to be my disciple, you must pick up your cross daily, deny yourself, and follow me. So that's the place that we need to go. If we want God to do something in our lives or through our lives, what we've got to do is we've always got to get back to that altar, that place where it ought to be easy for us. It certainly ought to be exhilarating for us to go and say, God, I messed up. Please forgive me. It's the cross that provides forgiveness. And they built an altar and they began to sacrifice on that altar as a way of worshiping the God who's allowed this remnant to come back into the homeland. Now, when they came to Zerubbabel, now make no mistake, the enemy knows exactly what he's doing. And these people were not trying to help Zerubbabel or Joshua at all. They did not serve the same God They had no interest in holiness or being a light to the pagan peoples around them. They were, in fact, the pagan peoples who were there in the land. And that's why Zerubbabel responds like this. Verse 3. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, it says Jeshua in the NIV, it's Joshua is a better translation. And the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered. You can highlight the heads of the families because this is amazing unity. This just demonstrates that those altars that they rebuilt were genuine. It demonstrates that their heart is in the right place. It also demonstrates that that unity is necessary in the body of Christ, whether it was thousands of years ago or today, in order for the light of Christ to shine in a dark world. Here's Zerubbabel's answer. I love this guy. You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us to do. Now, Cyrus didn't command them, but remember Cyrus permitted them to do so. And so now they're just taking sort of the initiative here 
And they're saying, look, you have no part in this. This is our work. You leave us alone. We'll do it. Now, Nehemiah, in his book, remember, Nehemiah and Ezra are companion books. Also, Esther, and we'll see the tie-in in the book of Esther tonight as well. Those books read together really tell an important story. And Nehemiah, when he began to build the wall, and of course the walls were for the defenses around Jerusalem, when he began to build the wall, Sanballat and Tobiah and the others, they got really upset about it, and they did everything they could to diminish the wall and to frustrate the work on the wall. When they saw that they couldn't frustrate them, they came alongside and said, hey, let us join you. And they said no. So later they sent a letter and they said, come down to us because we've got some stuff that we need to talk about. And Nehemiah, I love him too, he's so bold. And he said, I'm doing a great work here for God. Why would I leave this great work and go down there to you? You have no part or share in this work. Well, you can see that Zerubbabel now, Nehemiah later, They were in perfect harmony as it relates to this work. Now, this is for all of us a warning against compromise. You know, the world that we live in, it seems so spiritual. It seems so loving. Let's all sit down together, have a Coke and sing Kumbaya. But but, but you see, there are people that don't serve our Jesus. There are many professing Christian churches that don't serve our Jesus. They've got their own thing. They've created their own God. And yet to the world, it appears, well, they're Christians and you're Christians, so why don't you work together? Be on guard against relationships that will lead you or even could possibly lead you into compromise. One of the things that we learned with Joy of Jesus over our many years of doing it, when you have an event that draws a crowd as big as the crowd that we get at Joy of Jesus... You, you suddenly find yourself with all other kinds of people, Christians with their own agendas. They want to pass out their own flyers. They want to sell their own books. They want to get people to come and help them do the work, whatever their ministry is. And we've had over the years to tell people, no, 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 wait, this is what we do here. And we have no agenda. We're not trying to do anything to enhance our church or to add to our church. We're just here for one day to be really kind and tell people about the love of God. Be careful against partnering with people just because they say they're Christians. If they're not walking the same direction you're walking, stay away. You do your thing. One of the great things about the body of Christ and the way God has put it together is that he gives every church their own vision. And if, in fact, God has given us the vision that he's given us, and we're being faithful, we don't need other people to come and participate. We don't need them to give anything to us. We don't need them to provide anything for us. All we need to do is be faithful and let God do what he's going to do. And we tell him, God bless you. We love you. You go do your thing. We're doing our thing. And God will be glorified. And so often they want, well, well, we want to be a part of your thing too, or we want you to be a part of our thing. And, and those are the times we guys say, you know, we're just not going to do that. God has given us our lane, Calvary Chapel of San Antonio's lane. And we're going to stay in that lane. And that's exactly what Zerubbabel is saying right here. These Samaritans did not worship God as the exile did. Now, they claimed their Jewish heritage, But we also know that they worshipped many gods, and we know that from the beginning. Samaritans, you'll remember, were a result of the Assyrian invasion of the northern tribes of Israel. And Assyria's method of defeating their enemies was to scatter them and then intermarry with them, causing them to lose their Jewish culture. It is the reason that we see in the New Testament that Jews hated Samaritans, and Samaritans hated Jews. Jews looked down their nose at Samaritans. They were just this much above a Gentile. And certainly they didn't want anything to do with them. Jews didn't even walk on Samaritan soil. That's how much they hated them. And so there was this long-standing animosity, and right here Zerubbabel is saying, no, 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 
We got our thing. You got your thing. You do that. This is really wonderful leadership by Zerubbabel and Joshua. We simply cannot partner with the enemies of God. The ecumenical movement in our church culture, many of you will remember 9-11 and all of the ecumenical church gatherings, prayers from people of faith, from all the different faiths, and everybody was trumpeting that, like that was such a good thing. Our, our nation is in crisis, so let's get all of the holy men together and we'll pray, and all I could think was yuck. <laughs> That's not what we're supposed to do. Amos 3.3 3 is the principle in Zerubbabel's day, but it's the same principle in our day. How can two walk together unless they agree to do so? You know, back in the days before GPS, and you've got to be pretty old, I can understand, to be old enough to remember those days. But the way you navigated was you stopped at gas stations and they had these huge maps taped to the windows. See, there's some older people here laughing. We remember that. And I don't know what it was about people that worked at gas stations, but they were expected to know everything. Where's Jake's Diner? And they, oh, you just go down this street, turn left, and two more streets, you turn right. And that they just knew. You get more than one person in a car navigating. And you're going to have a clash of heads. You got to know where you're going and follow the Lord's direction. Zerubbabel and Joshua, they recognized this for what it was. It was an attempt by enemies, not friends, an attempt by enemies to turn their hearts of the men, turn the hearts of the men from the true work of God. Had they not been stopped, had Zerubbabel been one of those, yeah, praise the Lord, we can use all the help we can get. Well, what would have happened is eventually Samaritans who worshipped other gods. Now, I'm sure they made sacrifices to the real God. But remember, there's one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and with all of your soul. You shall have no other gods before him, beside him, or any other way. And clearly, based on Israel's history, what we know about them, they would have been enticed to start compromising by worshiping other gods as well, thinking, well, you know, the whole time um, we're worshiping our God too, so what's the harm? In fact, when you read Nehemiah, you're going to find that by the time he arrives on the scene, Jews are already intermarrying with Samaritans. And the worship of false gods is already going on. And that's why Nehemiah gets really tough. He has the laying on of hands ministry in the Old Testament. We simply cannot have divided loyalties. We got to choose. Our priority has got to be Jesus Christ and him alone. And we need to remain committed to him we need to make a decision on who we're going to serve and then remain committed. We still see this division, this sort of, well, it doesn't matter as long as you serve God. We see that in the church today. And we don't see enough Christians standing up and saying, no, this is a Zerubbabel ministry, a Nehemiah ministry. And we need to make a decision and be faithful. One personal application for all of us, this is the reason that the New Testament prohibits. Read that forbids marrying an unbeliever. And when I say that, people hate it. Well, that's not kind because, well, what if you fall in love with somebody who's not a believer? You're in danger. And we just throw that verse away. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Oh, well, but that's then and this is now. And after all, I met him or I met her online. And we all know that nobody lies online. We need to be really, really careful because God is trying to protect us. Now, the idea of separation here doesn't mean that we think we're better. 
It doesn't mean that we think we've got all the answers and nobody else does. It just means that we have to remain faithful and committed to the vision that God has given us and you individually. You've got to remain committed to that ministry. The minute you allow compromise in, you're going to find yourself in trouble. We need to be influencers rather than people who are influenced. We need to be leaders and not followers. Thank God for Zerubbabel and Joshua and Nehemiah. Thank God for those of you who are fully committed to your walk with the Lord and you're simply not going to listen to anybody who's going to try to drag you away at all. The Apostle Paul writes that we have to run in our lane. We have to run according to the rules. And Jesus is the one who lays down those rules. Verse 4 says, Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people. First approach, joining them didn't work. Here's the second approach. If you think there's not going to be opposition when you say yes to the Lord, then you haven't said yes to the Lord yet. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. The enemy is always trying to paralyze us with fear. Look at verse 5. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, the king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. Now, that would be subsequent kings of the same place. Now, this is important. They hired counselors. I have no idea why Christians go to anybody or any place else other than Jesus and the word of God for counsel. I don't get it. I really don't. Now, I know we've been brainwashed to believe that we need therapy or we need counselors. They're professionals. Let me say this very clearly. All of the foundational principles of modern day psychology, all of them were created by unbelieving, God-hating atheists. Now, what value is there in that when you've been given the word of God? We have the best counseling book, the best parental guidance book in the history of the world in Proverbs. And yet we'll take an opinion of somebody with a PhD instead of taking the counsel directly from the throne of God. Now counseling is good. We do a lot of counseling here. Proverbs also says there's Wisdom in a multitude of counselors, but there's only wisdom in a multitude of counselors if they're wise counselors. If they're counselors who discount God, if they're counselors who don't know God, what possible wisdom could there be? Now, if I'm trying to mortgage something or if I'm trying to to make a business deal or, or I'm trying to buy a building, wouldn't that be nice? then we're going to get counselors, professional people who tell us these are the rules, these are the things that you do. That's wisdom. But I'm certainly not going to ask them, hey, while you're trying to help me figure out how to do this, would you help me with this problem, this spiritual problem? We're not going to do that. Why? Because they have nothing to offer at all. And please note that the the, the purpose of this is to frustrate their plans because the enemy wants us to stop the work. When we get to verse 24 in this chapter, we're going to be told that these counselors were successful in a prolonged effort to stop the work, was successful for six years, from 536 B.C. to 530. The work continued only to following that for another 10 or more years. The work would stop because of this opposition. Be careful of the advice that you take, regardless of how people represent themselves. Now, verses 6 to 23, I'm just going to read it. Very little commentary is necessary. This is just sort of a a self-explanatory letter that's written to sort of straighten out this mess. Verse 6 says, At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, they lodged an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, this is the Xerxes from the book of Esther. So you get the time frame in your mind. And in the days of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, 
Bith, Bishlam, Midradath, and I can't see the letter, so please forgive me, to Beal and the rest of his associates wrote a letter to Artaxerxes. The letter was written in Aramaic script and in the Aramaic language. Now, Artaxerxes I, we've already encountered. He's the king who followed Xerxes. He's the one who will be ruling when Ezra shows up when we get to chapter 7. Historical records in the days of old were kept immaculately because the genealogies had to be proven and, and these records were often used as a reference, which is the, the situation here, the reason of this letter. It says in verse 8, Riam, the commanding officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, wrote a letter against Jerusalem. I love that characterization. It wasn't, well, let's see what's right and we want to do the right thing towards Jerusalem. They, they were against Jerusalem from the beginning. They wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. Rehem, the commanding officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, together with the uh, rest of their associates, the judges and officials over the men from Tripolis, Persia, uh, Erech, and Babylon, the Elamites of Susa, and the other people were the great and honorable um, Asher Benopoli, Benopol, departed or deported and settled in the city of Samaria and elsewhere in Trans-Euphrates. Parenthetically, this is a copy of the letter they sent him. To King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the men of Trans-Euphrates, the king should know that the Jews... Now, this is the first mention of Jews as a description of people who were Hebrews. The king should know that the Jews who came up to us from you have gone to Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They're restoring the wall and repairing the foundations. Furthermore, the king should know that if the city is built and its walls are destroyed, no more taxes, tribute, or duty will be paid. It's always been about money. And the royal revenues will suffer. Now, what's fascinating here is the Samaritans hated paying taxes and tribute and duty as well. So now they're just using it against only the Jews. Now, since we're under obligation to the palace and it's not proper for us to see the king dishonored, which again was not their motive, we're sending this message to inform the king so that a search may be made in the archives of your predecessors. In these records, you will find that this city is a rebellious city, troublesome to kings and provinces, a place of rebellion from ancient times. That is why the city was destroyed. By the way, all of that was true. We inform the king that if this city is built and its walls are restored, you will be left with nothing in trans-Euphrates. The king, this is Xerxes, sent this reply to Ram, the commanding officer, Shimshai, the secretary, and the rest of their associates living in Samaria and elsewhere in trans-Euphrates. Greetings. The letter you sent us has been read and translated in my Presence. Now, one thing to remember with all this letter going back and forth, this is not email. I had to sign something today. Matt, I think he was laughing at me, Pastor Matt, because it was when they wanted an electronic signature. I had no idea what to do. And I said, you mean if I click this button, my signature goes on there? I said, how do I sign it? And so Matt worked me through it, and it was done in an instant. This was a 900-mile trip. <laughs> it would take months and months to send a letter from one place to another and then months and months to get the letter back. So all the while, now remember, God's in heaven going, <laughs> I got him, because the building continues. I issued an order and a search was made and it was found that this city has a long history of revolt against kings and has been a place of rebellion and sedition. Jerusalem has had powerful kings ruling. That's true. Most notably, the reference here is to Solomon. Over the whole of Trans-Euphrates and taxes, tribute, and duty were paid to them. Now he's in a panic, the king. Now issue an order to these men to stop work so that this city will not be rebuilt until 
I so order. Now, if you read this correctly, I think what you see is this defiance building of this king. This is not going to happen. So until you hear from me, well, what we know from Nehemiah is that this king, and we're going to hear it next week in chapter 6, what we do know is that this king is going to issue an order. He's going to find that Cyrus did, in fact, say to do it. And they were bound by that law, so we had no choice but to let him build. All the while, God is in heaven with his people Rubik's Cube, <laughs> making sure that all of the places match. Be careful not to neglect this matter. Why let this threat grow to the detriment of the royal interests? As soon as the copy of the letter of King Artaxerxes was read to Rehum and Shimshai, the secretary, and their associates, they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem and compelled them by force to stop. The law they thought was now on their side. You guys have to stop. Verse 24 sadly says, Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. So the stalling tactics work for a moment. Actually, it was more than a moment. It was anywhere from 10 to 18 years that the work stopped. Now, what the Israelites then did was they began building their own homes. That's why in chapter 5, verse 1, we're going to see Haggai show up. And then after him, Zechariah show up because God is simply in heaven getting frustrated. You guys are building your own houses, but you're neglecting my house? I told you to go back and rebuild the altars. You did that. I told you to start the work on the foundation of the temple. You did that, and we had a great and glorious time of worship. But now I've told you to finish this work and just because somebody was huffing and puffing and threatening to stop the work, you gave in. Well, the reality is, and we all experience this at some point in our walks with the Lord, the reality is, to the Jews, finishing the work seems impossible. Now it's everything is against me, all hope, it appears, is gone. But God has these two men, Haggai and Zechariah, warming up in his spiritual bullpen. And he's going to send them to get results. Remember, when spiritual warfare occurs, you hang with Jesus because God wins. He always does. It won't be easy. There are times when you're going to lose hope. There's going to be times when you feel like you can't survive another day. God's always going to show up. I think three weeks from tonight when Paula and I share, you're going to see some of the things that God has done in our lives. They may seem like little tiny things to you, but they were huge, huge, mountainous things for us at just the right time. And we literally got to see the hand of God move over and over and over Zerubbabel and Joshua and later Ezra and Nehemiah are going to see the hand of God move in such miraculous ways because God is the one behind the scenes always in control. Now, what does God do when Christians get bogged down? He sends the word. I'm sure some of you tire of hearing me say, you've got to know your Bibles. You've got to be a student of the Word. The questions that you're asking, the answers are going to be found in the Bible. And we've got so many other things that we do. We're so easily distracted. I had a question yesterday in the program. I know I should read my Bible and I want to, but I get so easily distracted. Any tips, he said? I said, discipline. Discipline. If you've got questions, God has answers, but it's only going to be found in his word. Now, obviously, they didn't have the New Testament. So what did God do? He sent him his word in the form of Haggai and Zechariah. Verse 1, chapter 5. 
Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Iddo. Now Zechariah was a Levite. And he sort of gets promoted. He gets an in-house transfer. No longer Levite. Leave the priesthood. I'm going to elevate you to the office of prophet. I did a full study on the book of Zechariah. It's available at calvaryessay.com. It is a fascinating book. It's a fun book. But it's fascinating. And it's really, really hard. But it's so good. It's so rich. It's that Zechariah. They prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So here's what God does in those 10 years that the work was halted. He says, you go tell them, thus saith the Lord. And God sent these faithful prophets to exhort them to begin again. Now this was a really dark time for the returning exiles. As I said a minute ago, hope is vanishing. But God never forgets a work in process, even when the men do. One of the things that I tell people all the time, especially in our pastor's discipleship class, is that God's a finisher. God tells you to do something, and you start out to do it, and you don't finish it, you're not faithful, then there's not going to be any movement anywhere else. I mean, we can pick up and leave, and we can convince ourselves that, well, God is leading, the Holy Spirit is now leading me here. No, God's a finisher. And so when he tells you to do something, you do it with all of your heart, and you do it until God says you're done. We don't have the right. Now, we have the free will, but we don't have the right to stop just because things get hard. And unfortunately, that's what happens in our church culture. God is a finisher. This is the time, as I said, that the people were working on their own houses because their priorities were wrong. Their priorities were right when they started with the altars. But now, as the course of time, as opposition increases, their priorities have changed. Well, you know, we can't do that, so let's build our own houses. And in heaven, and I'm going to mischaracterize God a little bit here, but but in heaven, God's foot's tapping. When are they going to start on my house? That's what I told them to do. I didn't tell them to build their own houses. I would have taken care of them. But when are they going to build my house? And it's all because they've lost priorities. Some of your homes, and I mean that figuratively, not in the literal sense, but figuratively, your homes, your families, your foundation has fallen apart. You've lost your way. And you've got to rebuild that. And then as Nehemiah proves, you've got to rebuild the walls around the place of defense. And God is in heaven saying, well... They forgot me. So he sends Haggai and Zechariah. God always uses his word to correct, to rebuke, and to exhort. And the word of God will help you keep your priorities in order. Now Haggai would begin his preaching in August of 520 B.C. Zechariah, who is a much younger man, would be sent a couple of months later to work shoulder to shoulder with Haggai, um, knowing their personality is sort of a good cop, bad cop thing that they were doing. Haggai would go in with a hammer. Why are you building your homes and not God's homes? And Zechariah would then come behind him and say, it's okay, God will take care of your homes, but we've got to get back to the work that God called us here to do. It was time to get moving with the plan that God has for your lives. I won't make a big deal out of this, but I want all of you to know that if you're not being faithful to what God has called you to do, it's time to get moving in God's will all over again. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel horrible. God, I know I blew it. I'm so guilty. No, just say, God, I'm sorry. Let's start to work. And do what God has called you to do. And you get to start over. Why waste any more time? That's what Haggai and Zechariah told him. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedak, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them. Highlight this, please. Helping them. 
They were the ones helping with the work. It's not like Haggai said, well, you know, I'm the preacher. I have work to do. So I'm going to go home to my gated community while you guys do all the grunt work. No, they helped him. They delivered God's word. This is what servant leadership looks like. And then they enjoyed. Let me recommend a study that I did, and I don't normally do that. But Nehemiah chapter 3, you can go to calvaryessay.com and listen to it. You want to see the way a church is built? It's Nehemiah chapter 3. And Haggai and Zechariah are giving a wonderful example of what servant leadership is all about. They were helping them with the work. At that time, Tadani, the governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shethar Bozanay and their associates went to them and asked, Who authorized you to rebuild this temple and restore this structure? Now, this sounds harsh. And it really isn't, but it was the governor's job to make sure that the king's interests, Xerxes' interests, were being protected, being taken care of. We understand why he was alarmed when the work continued. They also asked, what are the names of the men constructing this building? And one of the ways the enemy is going to try to stop you from doing what God wants you to do is to intimidate you. And this is an attempt to intimidate the workers themselves. Give me your names. I know where you live is the idea here. Stop this right away until we get clearance on this. Or there may be repercussions that you don't want to have to endure. Verse 5. But. Buts can be good. They can be bad. This is a really good but. But the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews, and they were not stopped until a report could go to Darius and his written reply be received. They couldn't be stopped. Now, 900 miles? Months? Five months? Five months out? Five months back? So God is giving them time to keep doing the work. I also believe with all of my heart that this is God testing the Jews who are doing the work. Now here's another threat. Stop this work. Well, you get the letter and we'll stop. Well, that gave them minimally 10 months to keep doing the work, to let the progress go by their faithfulness to do the work, to be an example to the people around them. It's sort of like, you know, we're not afraid of you. I know I've talked too long already, but let me tell you a quick story. The year after 9-11, isn't it funny? I, I, I talked too long, but I'm going to keep going, and then at the end I'll apologize for taking too long. <laughs> the year after 9-11, we went to New York. We had 30, no, there was not 31 of us. There was 10 or 11 of us. Yeah, we, we went to New York for... Uh, um, just just to share Jesus with people. Went with another Calvary Chapel pastor that's a friend. And we decided, we felt it was the Lord's direction, we're going to stick together. And we traveled all over sharing Jesus with people. People getting saved. Subways, Subways, by the way, a great place to, to share Jesus. You talk about a captured audience and there's always people listening because there's nothing else to do on a subway train. But we're sharing Jesus with people and, and somebody pulled us aside, pulled me aside and said, look, Ron, these people have heard nothing but Jesus for a year. They're still in shock. Let's just be nice to them. Let's serve them and help them and cook food for them. And, but, but don't talk about Jesus anymore to them. And I looked at him and I said, well, I wouldn't have come if I knew that. How can I not tell them about Jesus? If they're hurting, how can I not tell them about Jesus? It's a test. When these kind of things happen, it's a test. So we called our people together and said, we're going to keep telling people about Jesus. And we got to be involved in some really, really neat things.
verse 7, the report they sent him read as follows to King Darius, cordial greetings. The king should know that we went to the district of Judah, to the temple of the great God. The people are building it with large stones and placing their timbers in the walls. Now, it, it's what, what we're going to see is an honest and fair evaluation of what's going on. But it seems like there was concern because the stones were large and it, it appeared like maybe they were building a fortress. And the governor needed to get that information to the king. He says, the work is being carried on with diligence and is making rapid progress under their direction. We question the elders and ask them, who authorized you to rebuild this temple and restore this structure? We also ask them their names so that we could write down the names of the leaders for your information. This is the answer they gave us. Now try to bear with me for another maybe eight minutes. That's how important this is. Because the Jewish leaders are giving the governor a history lesson. Tatnai was more than fair in reporting exactly what happened. And now the Jews are going to explain their side of the story. God will always get the glory. That's something that we need to remember. Whenever we're sharing, God always gets the glory. Here's what they wrote. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. And we are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, one that a great king of Israel built and finished. Again, Solomon is in view here. But because our fathers angered the God of heaven, he handed them over to Nebuchadnezzar the Chaldean, the king of Babylon, who destroyed this temple and deported the people to Babylon. Now, this is honesty. If you want to be protected spiritually, if you want to come out the other side of the spiritual warfare, you've got to be honest with God. No mistakes. You know, they could have written a letter. The kings don't have the history. They could have said, well, you know, we were attacked by other people and we lost, but, but this happened. No. Immediately they took responsibility. Because our fathers angered the God of heaven, he handed them over to Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon didn't beat Judah. God gave Judah into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar because God was angry with them. They didn't listen to the prophets. And they're honest, they're accepting responsibility. When you're in the middle of spiritual warfare, honesty is absolutely essential. You can't pretend that everything is okay. You be honest. Judgment begins in the house of God. Be honest. However, in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. He even removed from the temple of Babylon the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to the temple in Babylon. Then King Cyrus gave them to a man named Sheshbazar, and of course we know that Zerubbabel, whom he had appointed governor, and he told him, take these articles and go and deposit them in the temple of Jerusalem and rebuild the house of God on its site. So this Sheshbazar came and laid the foundation of the house of God in Jerusalem. From that day to the present, it has been under construction, but it's not yet finished. Now, if it pleases the king, let a search be made in the royal archives of Babylon to see if King Cyrus did, in fact, issue a decree to rebuild this house of God in Jerusalem. Then let the king send us his decision in this matter. Now, please note that the Jews were not disrespectful. They didn't get on a picket line. They didn't chant slogans. They didn't claim anything that wasn't theirs to claim. They simply laid out the case. They did it honestly. And now they're in a position where God can help them. And sometimes, especially when warfare is involved, only God can help you. And we need to just lay things out. And here's what they're saying. Hey, if in fact Cyrus did issue that decree, you're going to go find it. And when you find it, you're going to see that we're telling you the truth and we're going to continue building the temple until we hear otherwise. And this is a time when these men are simply saying, trust God. I love this story. Now, in chapter 6, that I can't get to tonight, 
we're going to find out exactly what happens. And it is absolutely wonderful. When you see God move in and through your lives, you won't want to settle for anything less ever again. That's why these chapters, chapter 6, are so very, very rich. So next week, the answer, and then the introduction of Ezra chapter 7, and Ezra, the man of God, comes on the scene. Father, as we close tonight,